sun was the center of our solar system long before Copernicus took note of it. The Earth was a roundish globe long before Columbus ever set sail to the east. And electricity existed long before Ben Franklin ever owned a kite. We have found a lot of wonderful and marvelous ways to use the scientific knowledge we've gained over the years. But from a larger perspective, it can be seen that we have simply been working our way through sequential paradigms of ignorance. <laughs> Go ahead, take your time. Go ahead. <laughs> it's time to restart science once more. Because everything we currently know, everything we think we know, is either wrong or terribly incomplete. And I can give you an example of it. Entropy, the second law of thermodynamics. It says that in a closed system, everything moves toward an evenly distributed uh, homogeneous state. The standard demonstration for this is a sugar cube in a glass of water. After some, you guys start out with two discrete orderly compounds after some passage of time, they mingle and it becomes evenly distributed and homogeneous, standard high school chemistry. E equals mc squared, Einstein's famous equation details the relationship between pure energy and matter, but it also shows the difference between them. The little equal sign, that's a dividing line as well. Unless there's an ongoing flow of pure energy E, into the physical universe, mc squared, then the physical universe is a closed system and ought to move toward that homogeneous, evenly distributed state. Observation, the universe is not evenly distributed nor homogeneous in any way whatsoever. Across these trillions of years, we find quasars, black holes, endless galaxies, uh, exoplanets even, and on our own, we're finding quarks and flavored particles of all kinds. The universe is so highly differentiated, so finely de defined, in fact, that you see my hand? Some parts of it have become observant and communicative. What is going on? Is there some heretofore unexamined leakage or form of influence from the pure energy side of the equation? Let's take a brief look at the history of such examinations. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip over sorcery and witchcraft. <laughs> and pay scant attention to popular otherworldly explanations. Yeah, I'm sure we've all seen enough of that. If the phrase, it can't have come from the human brain, is your major metric, you might as well include cheese whiz in your studies. <laughs> now, we must take a more thoughtful, oh, you like that one. <laughs> we must take a more thoughtful and even an introspective approach in this matter. Quantum physics, as obscure as it is, is still very clear in one thing. The universe does not exist somewhere out there separated from us. In quantum mechanics, it is impossible to completely isolate the observer from what is being observed. In fact, the only thing Werner Heisenberg was ever really certain about was that atoms are not things. They are only tendencies. Does pure energy have a tendency to become matter, lacking only one thing? In uh, the quantum world it is the act of observation which causes tendencies and potentials to collapse into atoms, into physical being. Is there something which we are referring to as observation that, that co causes our entire universe to come into existence? For the moment, let's set aside Hubble's ultra deep field right now and we'll turn our gaze in the other direction. What is it? that comes under this heading we are calling, for lack of a better word, observation. And why does observation create the kinds of things we find? Consider a woodpecker. Instead of eating insects that crawl around on the ground or up the side of the tree it's clinging to, a woodpecker will bore a hole through solid wood with its face. 
Anybody here care to feel responsible for that? <laughs> of course not. Whatever it is we're referring to as observing is far subtler than you and I here in this room. Now, for most of human history, science has been the speculative subject of alchemists and charlatans. At one time, finding a magnetic rock or creating a spark was cause for either fear or concern. Yet today, we take electricity and magnetism completely for granted, and in fact, we're, we're quite lost without it. To make the analogy, right now, we are in the alchemist and charlatan stage of identifying that which observes. <laughs> now, because we cannot observe anything without changing it in some manner, we cannot observe the act of observation directly and see it clearly. We, we get too close, we get in the way. Perhaps we'll develop uh, oblique peripheral approaches mirroring familiar two-way double-blind experiments. But remember this, it won't be a matter of what we see. It will be how we see that will matter. With that in mind, we are faced with a choice. A choice requiring not only great imagination, but great courage as well, because the meta-analysis of this is not going to be comfortable for everyone. Are we going to sit here happily, contentedly, in our current and quickly aging paradigm of ignorance? Or will we have the courage to look forward, dig in, and find what the future holds for us? It is my hope that we have that courage to dig in and connect our imaginations with our data. Because they tell you this, when the elusive theory of everything is finally found, it will be intrinsically entwined with that which observes. At the moment, the greatest obstacle to uh, further research in this field of study are clandestine quasi-governmental agencies, which conspire to block every avenue of inquiry available, and they have frozen my bank accounts. <laughs> you can help. Send your do generous donations to this. No. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Focus right here. Everything, all your answers will be answered. <laughs> Every talk you've seen here today, TEDx Rochester is the best thing you have seen all year. <laughs>